Nui O Hawaii um, Job Board. And we're going to talk about that today here on the Military in Hawaii with Bernice Glenn and Kali'i Kane. Um, they're both associated with Hui O uh, Hawaii, and uh, which is a new program, a very promising program, composed of a lot of public-private members. And welcome to the show, you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Bernice, let's start with you. Uh, what is this program about and who is motivating it? So this program is about helping to fill jobs that will be part of the Pacific Deterrence Initiative, a very large federal effort to build uh, capacity across all of the different defense contractors and services um, in the Indo-Pacific region, and specifically looking at uh, technology jobs, analysts' jobs, um, jobs that will support what's called the intelligence surveillance reconnaissance missions of all of our services as we look at a very hotly contested Indo-Pacific region. We're seeing a lot of activity that are even reaching our shores. We're seeing the Pacific Islands being impacted and certainly the threat of what may happen in Taiwan. So the idea is to build a workforce um, here based in Hawaii that can be responsive, that can integrate all of the different data that's coming in through uh, sensors and uh, all of the different collections, collection sites of data and fuse them in real time for decision makers to be able to discern uh, without sort of the cloud of war um, to discern what's really happening in the region at the moment. Mm, we want that, absolutely. So um, what, 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 qualify, what is your role and what qualifies you to be part of this uh, job board? Yeah, so um, both Ka'ili Kane, who's with me now, who is the lead of the job board, and I uh, work for a group that was um, uh, commissioned by the Chamber of Commerce of Hawaii and Cyber Hawaii, uh, the Chamber's Military Affairs Council and its Hawaii Defense Alliance um, to work on this job board. Um, my background is in uh, technology commercialization and working specifically in the defense field and also in rapid contracting vehicles for the federal government. So my um, uh, last role was really to scope out and develop with um, leaders in the defense um, uh, world, such as Huntington Ingalls, and Booz Allen Hamilton, sort of their pathways to recruit talent. So we came up with a strategic plan, and part of the plan relied on what we called um, a, a whole community approach to recruiting talent, because talent for technology companies in particular is extremely um, competitive right now to recruit, whether you're public sector or private sector. And we took a page out of China's book of a whole community approach, but in a very holistic Hawaii way, um, the chamber had set up the Hawaii Defense Alliance, which is funded by the State of Hawaii Department of Business, Economic Development and Tourism out of a DOD contract for economic um, readjustment. And we looked at city, state, um, all of the assets uh, across the academic um, institutions in Hawaii, all of the different companies, whether they're large or small, um, and uh, and it was really the chamber who took the lead in pulling this effort together. And I'll segue to Ka'ili because Ka'ili is our uh, next generation lead on this program because she has a foot in both worlds. I'm like you, uh, Jay, I've been at this for a while, kind of long in the tooth. <laughs> and I was also, now I'm on the HTDC board, kind of taking up your banner. Um, but Ka'ili has um, come from a really um, grounded um, base here in Hawaii, and she uh, has really been uh, integral to designing and developing this outreach to her generation, because it's really the talent in her generation that this has to speak to. Um, so I might segue to you. I want, I want to correct one thing you said, Bernice, that it's not just Kali'i, uh, it's, it's all three of us are part of the next generation. You know, um, it, it, it's 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 your it's your mindset that counts. Yeah. And anyone can be in the next generation. Okay, Kylie, uh, tell <laughs> tell <laughs> uh, so t t tell us what you're doing um, as the lead and what you hope to achieve. Yeah, of course. So, my role um, basically to integrate all of our um, DOD contractors here provide these positions that we need to fill in the next few years.
that we really want to fill with our Kama Aina as well as those Kama Aina, such as myself who went to school on the mainland, got a degree, didn't really know what to do with their degree, where they could fit into this whole military sector we have in Hawaii, that honestly, um, I would say there's a big majority of people who don't want the military here, but they are completely necessary and they're not going anywhere for some time. So I think it's really important to create these pathways for people in my generation, Bernice's and yours, mm -hmm. to figure out where the puzzle fits. And so with this platform, we are really laying out across the board, all of the different types of positions and pathways that we can bring people home and keep people home also. Yeah, yeah, that's important. Uh, I would like to read a list of all the members of this public-private partnership. Okay, it is a, um, let's see, okay. Um, the Hawaii DVET, the Hawaii Department of, uh, what is it, Economic Development and Tourism, the Hawaii Defense Alliance, you mentioned, Bernice, the Chamber of Commerce of Hawaii, you mentioned, the Military Affairs Council of the Chamber of Commerce, uh, the University of Hawaii and Cyber Hawaii, which Cyber Hawaii, that's, that's, that's really important if you're talking about tech jobs. Um, and they're all working together. So, uh, Kylie, have you, have you met with them? Do you work with them? Do you, do you see representatives yeah, of these so, organizations? Yes, we do. We meet with them quite often. Um, we really wanted this to be a team effort because it, it is a team effort. And it was really important for us to everyone to be a part of it, have a say and contribute because it's affecting all of them. Um, we also really wanted to include UH as we created this platform because they also have their own programs at UH, um, specifically a program called Leap Start, which is our basically our pipeline. Um, they create internships, um, provide certifications for all of these DOD positions that segue into the job positions that we have from the DOD contractors on the platform. You know, Kylie, I, I want to talk to you about this generation. I mean, I know. Bernice and I, we, we, we see ourselves as part of the going forward aspect of our discussion today. But in fact, you, you were part of the generation. Um, and um, I want to ask you, you know, straighten me out on what is, the, what is this, the, the, <laughs> the, the termination generation, uh, the, the quiet, quiet quitting generation? Um, are people, <laughs> they seem to be leaving jobs, but then they don't have jobs and they stay at home. And they work at home, but they don't want jobs in the office. I mean, I'm very confused as to what your generation actually wants in terms of jobs. Do, <laughs> do they really want a job or do they really, you know, don't want a job? What is it? I think the best answer to your question would just be that my generation is money hungry, which would explain the hopping around of job positions. Um, statistics have shown that people my age most likely will stay in a position for two years and when offered a higher paying position will take it and not even think twice. Um, so that's really the answer, just being money hungry. And I think especially that with- That doesn't COVID, sound like Hawaii to me. <laughs> Hawaii, you stay with a job for a long time, sometimes your whole life. Uh, you're not mm -hmm. money hungry. You care about helping people. Uh, you, wanna, you wanna have good friends that last forever. Uh, that sounds like a whole new paradigm, isn't it? Well, that's the that's the type of culture we want to bring back also um, by providing these positions for um, economic sustainability as well as having um, the type of income that you don't need to search for another job while you're in a position. You want to have a steady income where you feel comfortable staying there in a company culture you enjoy, which is the great thing about these companies we're working with on the platform. They provide that and they have fabulous CEOs and presidents that I've gotten to talk to personally that I can say it would be an amazing place for anyone my age to be a part of that family. Yeah, sure. So, so but there's a transitional point. 
um, people who want two-year jobs and who are have ants in their pants about making big money. Um, uh, <laughs> is that the kind of applicant you want? Because that you know, if I'm a defense contractor, I'm not sure I want that. Uh, I want somebody who'll stick around. How, how do you rec reconcile the two views of the matter? And and maybe I can jump in with a few points before Kaili jumps in with hers too. But um, part of the packages that now these defense contractors are offering is really um, the as exactly as Kaili was saying, creating a corporate culture with work, live, play. You know, sort of a balance of of life, work balance, um, but also meaningful work, work where you really know that what you're doing every day actually contributes, in this case, to national security and security for your home, for your family, for this island. We really are in these jobs, they will actually be very cognizant of the true threats that are facing our region, but in fact, Hawaii itself. So the, the feeling of number one, being surrounded by professionals and even top leaders, as Kaili was mentioning, that, you know, are, are, that care about the workforce because they know how valuable it is. I mean, this is an era that we've never seen before, I think, in terms of techno the technology industry where you cannot afford to lose a person after two years. So they are really stepping up to the plate straight across the board, all of these companies with um, upskilling, um, you know, sort of the, the camaraderie building, but also meaningful, interesting work that keeps you engaged. Because I think that's the one thing we know about this generation. If they feel that this is interesting enough and the problems are really hard to solve but intriguing and they're going to get support to do it, they actually plug in really heavily. So it's that finding that, that um, uh, emotional and professional um, commitment and link that's really key to what we've seen, at least in this generation. Yeah, you bet. I want to disclose that I am very, very, very patriotic. I'm, I am mean, I'm in the top 1% of being very, very, very patriotic. I really care about the country more as life goes on. But, um, you know, not everybody in Hawaii is patriotic. And, um, you know, we have seen people who really don't care much about the United States here in Hawaii. You, you referred to that, uh, Kylie. Um, and, yeah. and uh, we, you know, we, we, one, one, once upon a time, Think Tech had a program about uh, the military in Hawaii. It was a luncheon panel program. And there were protesters outside the front door of our program, believe it or not. Who were pro and I said, what, what are you protesting about? Well, it's just the military. Uh, we're protesting. So anyway, what I'm saying is not everybody is, um, you know, is, is kind and favor, favor the military. And, and everybody is patriotic. So uh, how do you handle that? When you're looking for applicants for these jobs, uh, you do want patriotic people. Um, is it possible to take somebody who's not patriotic and make that person patriotic? You know, if somebody presents uh, at, at the uh, Chamber of Commerce and says, my name is Ed Snowden, and, uh, I, <laughs> and I would like you to, you know, show me the, you know, the national secrets because I have a plan and I care a lot. Right. <laughs> How do you screen him out? Yeah, well, I, I think to your point um, specifically around him that um, that there have been a lot of screening processes now put in place, particularly with NSA Hawaii um, uh, as as a you know kind of key organization that actually is a lead organization in helping to um, pull people in who may not think of a job at all with government or may not think at all of a job in national security, but they pull them in, they and others pull them in through, for example, University of Hawaii, West Oahu. Um, they have a cybersecurity program. So this is highly in demand in the private sector, um, highly in demand you know, in the public sector, but the cybersecurity program, as an example, pulls in all of these students, many of whom have no interest whatsoever in national security, um, but they start to show them what the work really is in these different sectors. This is what it's like in the private sector. This is what it's like in the public sector. And they have to self-select. You know, you can't, you can't force an interest in national service. You can't force an interest in service. Um, so it actually does turn out to be a, a self-selection effort. But I think the bigger thing is as we start to see 
the threats rising. I mean, certainly in the Pacific Islands, which are, are you know, basically cousins, right, across the, this little inlet. Um, as we start to see, for example, their food security being highly threatened, as we start to see China building out throughout the Pacific Islands, um, taking over their security programs, taking over their roads and airports, there is going to be a building awareness of the crisis that Hawaii could be facing. And sometimes that stimulates a desire to become engaged and protect, because you're protecting then your community. It's not sort of a theoretical thing and some guy is going to tell you to do something you don't want to do. Um, so I think that's a confluence of what we might see. Well, the threat in the Pacific is, uh, you know, is of a struggle. We saw that uh, when Nancy Pelosi uh, appeared in Taiwan a few days ago. Um, and so, um, you know, we this this threat, these um, aggressive possibilities uh, in in the Pacific is the reason uh, for all this defense contracting. We're trying to build a, a defense hub, to use that word here in Hawaii. We want that for many, many reasons, including local community, local industry, local economy, and so forth. Um, but at the same time, um, you know, hacking and uh, the sophistication of the AI applications uh, that are in competition all around the world, and especially with Russia and China, are very important. And um, it, it goes beyond Snowden. It goes to a a whole kind of confusion about just exactly what is classified information and what are the penalties for inappropriately revealing it. We, we see that in the headlines, uh, as I was telling you before the show began, uh, every day now. Um, and I think the former president is, is shedding a certain amount of confusion on classified information, declassification of information, penalties having to do with the inappropriate use or uh, revelation, um, you know, public, publicization, but, publishing of classified information. I mean, this is this has really got to be central if you're talking about um, technology that is sensitive, um, technology that is in the competition, the technical technological competition between us and China and Russia right now. So I mean I, I, I agree that you you know you want to have people who will self-select and 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 understand this, but you also have to have systems um, to screen out anybody who is confused. Uh, we cannot afford that confusion. Oh, yeah. And, and I mean, to be really clear, there is a very specific security clearance process. But and on top of that, there's a very specific vetting process that takes place even of subcontractors and their vendors, right? Because you actually have to drill down into foreign-owned controlled interests, um, even uh, influence of key technical people in universities. We, we've seen overreach as a result of that sometimes, too. But the vetting aspect of this is um, absolutely planted uh, within the system. So everything from recruitment of people, um, that is a, um, the security clearance process is the other part of this system that we're looking at in terms of um, letting young people know ahead of time if they are interested in a future in these different types of um, positions they really have to be able to pass a security clearance. And that takes planning and it takes an awareness because when you're 15, 16, you're not necessarily thinking, <laughs> you know, that what you're going to do at the party that weekend is going to impact your future job. You're right, but it does, it does doesn't yeah. it? You have to start thinking about that early on in your life. <laughs> And people have to tell you, right? So that's actually built into the phase after we set up the job board and get the flow going is almost like a character education process, if you will, to allow people young enough, early enough in their lives to understand when they make decisions, how that might cut off opportunities for them, not just in Hawaii in these jobs. I mean, it, that actually will impact them long term. So our 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 whole rollout involves the character education component as well as actual skills like there are very specific certifications tied to some of these positions that are not a huge barrier necessarily. For example, in geospatial intelligence, there are five certificates that they would need to have. And there are programs where high school students can actually become certified in these areas. And then the companies are interested in than hiring them, but putting them through a four-year college because they want them to expand in their career. 
character education and security clearances are all part of that. So to your point, um, uh, uh, the part where it gets very porous is frankly, when you get into testing and evaluating new technologies to drill down to see what the foreign owned controlled interest elements are in each of those companies. Because many times those small companies don't know themselves that there's someone behind the investor. So mm. those are processes that are in place. And I, I have to say our intelligence community is very much engaged in this, like from the beginning and very thoroughly. So, um, but to your point, it needs to be. Um, so it needs to be, I, you know, I, my own view, as I said, I'm very patriotic and I'm very protective of national security. And if I had to make a choice between somebody who was questionable in terms of their loyalty to the country, their ability to follow the, the classified information rules and uh, competent, but questionable in terms of their ability to follow the rules, I wouldn't hire them. Yeah. It's too risky. It's a Snowden risk. Yeah. Um, and you have to be sure. So, uh, Kylie, I want to change subjects a little bit and make myself an applicant, okay? And I call you or write you or come in and see you, whatever the case may be. <laughs> Maybe I have a Zoom thing. Um, and I'm going to say, look, I don't know what kind of job <laughs> I want. I just want a really good job. Uh, I want to, because I, I, you know, I'm, I'm in that generation that's a little, um, you know, I'm, I'm the termination generation or whatever. Um, and uh, what's your advice to me about what kind of job I should focus on? And what kind of jobs do you have available that, you know, I would be most interested in? Okay. Can we have that conversation? Uh, tell me what you would say. Yeah, of course. <laughs> well, I think, first of all, we should um, address our highlighted industries that will be encompassing these 800 positions. So I'll just go ahead and list them off. The we haven't, we haven't discussed that on the air. 800 positions are open, at least as far as you guys can see right now. And as I recall, most of them are yes. uh, most of them are um, what virtual. And uh, yeah, how does that work? Tell, tell yeah. me about that, Bernice. So maybe the breakdown is um, we're focused right now on um, a proof of concept base of 100 jobs that are currently on the website that Kaili is going to walk you through and introduce you through as if you're a candidate. Um, the, um, the full range is going to be about six to 800 jobs over two years. So it's going to build to that. What we are also looking at, however, because we're looking at job opportunities for Hawaii people are those remote jobs that are in that same category. And that right now, today, there are about 500 of those um, that are in the same categories that we're recruiting for for the jobs located in Hawaii. So um, I will segue to Ka'ili um, as to if you're the job applicant, how do you walk through it? Where do you log in? Okay. Here I am. I'm salivating all over these jobs. <laughs> <laughs> I want one. Uh, tell me what, what I should focus on, what's available to me, and what's not. Of course. So our highlighted industries, it's a pretty long list and it's exciting, include data analysts, communications, and signal systems, including 5G, Starlink, and satellite, geospatial information scientists, linguistics, especially Chinese and Russian, ec economists, human geography, area specialists, including China, North Korea, Pacific Islands, and the Indo-Pacific region, project management, information technology, cybersecurity, mobile airfield and smart warehouse distribution, logistics systems, supply chain, predictive and analytics, secure infrastructure, construction management. So say did you're- you do that list out of memory? Yeah. That, that I did. Very I did. impressive. <laughs> <laughs> so let's say you're a um, Chinese language specialist. Um, you would want to first either visit bridge.climbhigh.org or you could go to hawaiialliance.org, hawaiidefensealliance.org. And there you can find um, access to the platform. It's called bridge.climbhigh.org. And all you would need to do is register on the system and you'd be given um, a username and a password to access the entire platform. And if you're the candidate, you would see all of the positions listed and you can filter the system to linguistics to see all of the positions that these DOD contractors offer and you can just go ahead and apply right on the platform. And they've made it really easy to communicate with these companies that you're 
apply, um, applying for a position. And um, I would say it's kind of like texting through the, in, like um, IMing. You can just communicate back and forth right there. And so we've made it really easy. Um, we really wanted to create this almost intimate um, relationship between the company and the candidate where they communicate and you really know um, what you're getting at face value. Suppose I'm, um, you know, I'm, I, I do not speak Russian and I do not speak Chinese, <laughs> um, but I would like to because I, you know, in the world, in the future of the world, those languages may be at least in my perception, useful. Um, so is, is that a barrier? I mean, will you consider me? Will you try to place me even if I have no skill, but only interest? Mm. So I'll jump in for a second and then Ka'ili can follow. But um, so one of the things that we're gonna be adding uh, to the platform later will be the linkages to the upskilling opportunities. And in particular, the University of Hawaii is um, really one of the first, I think, or early, early in the list of um, states in the nation that are offering um, intelligence, um, meaning the social sciences, linguistics, et cetera, um, economics, uh, uh, undergraduate and graduate degrees. So that's been uh, designed and developed really in sync with all of these different um, defense contractors and the ultimate federal agencies. So you might send me to school to learn yeah. Russian or Chinese. Or oh, you could, or you could. That is a great thing. <laughs> yes, <laughs> you could also, um, you could also come in from, say, a project management background. If you have something like project management, but you want to expand into these other areas, um, the companies themselves have incredibly robust um, career mapping and um, training. So we're not duplicating what they're doing, but we're trying to aggregate on one site all of those different opportunities. Mm. Okay, so I uh, so um, I'll, I'll follow my own uh, case study here. Let's say Russian, okay, and maybe you can find a company that will fund my education in Russian, whether it's full time, part time, you know, or correspondence course, whatever it may be. Um, now, um, uh, and they offer me a job. They say, well, you know, you look pretty good. You. You know, we think you would be useful in our intelligence or social sciences uh, studies. Um, what happens then? Um, is there a standard, a standard uh, uh, compensation? Are there standard terms? Or is that negotiable, um, you know, contractor and subcontractor by contractor and subcontractor? I mean, who determines? Do you have parameters where if they offer me dollar half a day, it isn't going to be enough? <laughs> And then you're going to step in and say, wait a minute, you've got to be fair. What about that? Are you, are you part of the transaction itself? Uh, I'll, I'll jump in. But uh, essentially, each company is going to be competing for talent. So the nature of economics, they're going to be literally competing against each other for that same talent. They call themselves competimates, these defense contractors, because they know that they want to grow a base of talent. And they also know that many people may end up over their, their work lifetime switching between those same defense contractors. So they are always pushing the envelope in terms of what they offer. So that's really the nature of the free market is that we know for, for those skill sets, they're high demand. Um, and, and there are companies you know, outside of Hawaii that are competing for those skills as well. Um, so we kind of, but ranges are, are actually, I mean, they'll, they actually post what the salary range is. So it's very transparent. You'll be mm, able to Good. We like that. So, you know, one of the things we discussed be, before the show began, Kyla, it was uh, this whole notion about uh, hiring local or not. And, um, you know, I mean, I've always yeah. felt that the uh, tech industry ought to support local applicants and build a tech industry, build an industry wherever you get them, but build it locally. And, and that means in large part hiring local. Um, but you can't, you can't limit yourself to local, especially in a, a defense situation like this one, you know, you have to, you have to be global or at least national anyway. Um, and so how do you handle that? Uh, do you, do you encourage local? Do you encourage um, national? I mean, mainland, uh, or do you encourage neither and just see what happens? 
<laughs> right now we're encouraging both with an emphasis on Kama Aina. You know, really we want our Kama Aina to come home, but at the end of the day, um, these positions do need to be filled with qualified individuals. And they're also competing for these positions. And we want to help the Kama Aina as much as we can. But there's also retired military who are on the mainland who served here, who believe that Hawaii is home and would like to come back home. And these positions are open to them as well. And that's essentially what we want to do is fill these positions with qualified individuals who love Hawaii and want to contribute to our socioeconomics here. Well, to be clear, these are civilian jobs, right? They're not military yes. jobs. You don't have to you know, go back in or anything like that. Uh, and, and of course, uh, with any civilian job, and I can tell you as somebody who interviewed and hired young lawyers uh, for years and years, uh, the big question is whether they fully understand Hawaii, because Hawaii, Hawaii is different, it's different. Okay, and living here is different, and the cost of living, the cost of a you know dozen eggs and all that is different. Um, and so, you know, there needs to be a kind of uh, understanding on their part of what they're getting into, and it needs to be a, a socialization on your part um, to make sure that uh, you know their experience in entering the Hawaii market, so to speak, the, the Hawaii community is 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 pleasant and 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 works. So, how do you do that? Are you doing that? If you're not, who else is? Um, so, so right now, a lot of the companies themselves have identified that as as a key element of um, ensuring that those who do come in to Hawaii from outside, um, for retention purposes. I mean, it's you know, it's economically driven as well as team spirit driven that you want people who come to Hawaii to stay and really become grounded and committed to the community. So they each have their own immersion programs, essentially, where they're integrating them into the community at large. Um, one example is Huntington Ingalls, who brings a lot of their um, uh, staff together to work at the, um, uh, at the Native Hawaiian fish pond that's at Pearl Harbor. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that one, but this is a really unique um, uh, um, this is a really unique fish pond that was established 480 years ago. Um, it was by the Oahu Sovereign. But who's counting? Yeah. <laughs> by by um, the Oahu Sovereign, who really, you know, master planned these these fish ponds. But she also she also brought together her warrior cast to support it and to focus on it. And so a lot of the Huntington Ingalls people, when they are first brought on intentionally they bring them in to number one learn protocol number two to be in a community setting with the IAEA community combined with the native Hawaii community combined with the navy families so that's a really unique blend and that gets them anchored and it's very transformative actually oh i think this is all transformative yeah. this program will change lives no question about it so i'm going to return to our case study Kali. Okay, so you remember me. I'm the one who came in and I wanted to study Russian. You put me together with, uh, you know, one of, one of your client companies. Uh, but, you know, I spent six months there and I didn't like it. I, I just didn't, didn't work out for me. They tried. They tried to socialize me and, uh, you know, bring me into the fold. But mm, I just didn't feel good about it. So I quit. I'm back. I'm back. <clears throat> Hi, Kylie. I want another job. <laughs> Will you take me the second time around? Uh, will you let me apply again? Um, you know, are you going to help me on the on the return trip? Mm -hmm. So once you're registered and on the platform, you're on the platform, and you're free to um, browse and look at all of the positions. And once you are accepted by um, from applying at a certain company, that doesn't mean that you're removed you're still on there and you're free to apply elsewhere. Okay, I, the other thing I wanted to mention to both of you is that uh, years ago, <clears throat> you know, everybody thinks that Think Tech Hawaii, our middle name is technology. And indeed, my greatest interest is technology, uh, aside from patriotism, of course. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, I really care about developing a tech industry in the state. I, you know, this has been something from John Burns forward. I mean, we've all wanted that for all these years. And you guys may be very promising in terms of having the resources, the ability, the interest, and the applicants, you know, and the employers 
uh, to put this all together. Um, and you know, to me, that's um, that's that's really important. Um, but but the question is, oh, so a few years ago, I was contacted by a recruiter from the East Coast, and her job in the world was to recruit for the very same kind of people that you're recruiting for now. Uh, and she was having a terrible time on the East Coast. So she bought a plane ticket, she came to Hawaii, and she found me. And she took me out to a coffee, and she said, I need you to put me in touch with a lot of people who are looking for tech jobs in, in, in Hawaii, and then I can place them with military contractor employers. I said, well, I, I'll give you a handful of names, but you know, I'm, I can't provide you with 800 names, I'm sorry. Uh, <clears throat> and she said, that's my problem. I can't find a lot of people either in Hawaii or on the mainland you know, who want this kind of work. Uh, for one reason or another, many reasons perhaps, it's just hard to recruit in this area. Have you seen that? Do you worry about that? Uh, how are you going to handle that if that is the case? Bernice? Yeah, so um, one of the things that we're looking at specifically is reaching out to the Hawaii clubs of universities on the mainland um, for those intersections between the, the skill sets and the desire possibly to come home. Um, also uh, out to alumni groups um, because oftentimes it's the experienced people who want to come home. For example, their parents are aging and they've had their experience um, on the mainland, um, now they're managerial level and they want to bring something back home that they've learned, you know, they actually are giving back that way. Um, and so uh, uh, the, also the, as Ka'ili was talking about transitioning military, military who have been here before, um, but also uh, the pipeline of talent. So you have to actually address it from many, many different sources and the coconut wireless and the, you know, the network of what I, so I was a tiger mom. I was really bad, <laughs> really bad. As a we tiger. know about tiger moms. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I, and, and I learned my lesson. Don't push. But anyway, so, <laughs> so, um, uh, a lot of those networks of parents actually knowing about this opportunity, um, family members, you know, thinking, about their siblings who had to go away because they couldn't find these jobs here or people who went away but they've always wanted to come back in some capacity and and honestly the aging parents phenomenon is a really big one attracting people back home so um so part of this big push especially why it's the hawaii defense alliance and the whole community approach is to get that coconut coconut wireless started for people to say, hey, you know, is your what's your son doing? You know, now that he's graduating in the next year at from UW, or what about your, you know, son who went to West Point and now he's at that seven year mark? Does he want to come home? I mean, it's some of it is social networking and very intentional placement of information about this program. So not leaving it to chance, but the other is hopefully to spark that network of the whole community where people are starting to talk about it. Did you hear about the 600 to 800 jobs being in, being created in Hawaii where they really want Hawaii people to fill them? That's the very first time that we in Hawaii have ever had this opportunity. So mm. I think that's the theme. So we're almost done and I, and I uh, wanna ask you one, one more uh, question. So I'm gonna put you in touch with the whole generation now. You're speaking to them. And you're going to be speaking to them a lot, I think. You and Bernice, you got to get out there, and you got to make you know pass the word. So uh, and and you know we're having this conversation, my case study, of course. And um, I say to you, ah, military, ah, I don't want any part of that. I, I don't want to work for government, you know. I don't want to do that. I I'll, I'll, I like to be in the private sector. Um, what's your answer to me? What do you say to overcome that reluctance? For me personally, I think it's being able to know that I'm contributing to my home. Um, it's our economy. It's not just the military. You're contributing to the Hawaii economy and um, filling this position that gives back to the community as well as um, being patriotic. You know, you're you are you are working for a private company, but you're also in partnership with the military. And I think you just have to switch the mindset 
and you at the end of the day you're contributing and that's personally how I feel I don't feel like I'm working for the for the military I don't feel like you're part of the DOD but it's for my home for my family for my community uh, well put so Bernice uh, I'll leave you with the last question and that is um, you know a part of this, of course, is to um, you know help help the country, help the defense contractors, help build the hub, if you will, in the Pacific, where you know Hawaii's destiny. People have said that for a long, long, long time. Hawaii's destiny is to be the hub of the Pacific, the center of the Pacific, and this is really one way to do it. But but my question is, um, you know, we have been thrashing around since the end of the plantations um, for for some meaningful industry. Uh, to be the you know the base of our community aside 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 from tourism, which may not be the the kind of career you really want to have, and uh, I mean how does this offer that possibility? I mean, and, and inherent to my question is, can I get to be the CEO here, um, or or am I going to be um, you know at at a certain level working certain kind of contract strata, uh, or am I going to be a, a manager? Uh, can I have a career? Make me a career, will you, Bernice? Is it possible? <laughs> yeah. So there are three different pathways that this wave is offering. Um, and I should say, while it's defense spending oriented, the real challenge for us in Hawaii is to ensure that this big wave of, of uh, investment not only goes to filling these jobs that are with as many Hawaii people as possible and filling the pipeline of innovation for these large companies drawing on Hawaii companies and other small companies from the mainland as well. But it's also um, really incumbent on us in Hawaii to figure out how we use this wave to ensure that we have a commercial base of success because the defense spending will come in a big wave and it'll last for five, maybe 10 years. It may abate like it did before. So it's really up to us in Hawaii to say, okay, what are the key technologies that are needed by both the commercial and defense um, economy right now and over the next five to 10 years? Because what we build here in terms of our talent, our technical talent that will go through these companies, the small businesses that will subcontract, we should be give, keeping an eye on what the commercial markets are that mimic those same needs. For example, we know that uh, we know that supply chain disruption is going to be an issue for a really long time. We know that logistics management uh, powered by AI. We know that um, uh, being able to set up airstrips in remote areas when there's a human when there, there's a natural disaster. We know certain things will always be true in our region. The supply chain and the tyranny of distance will always be our challenge, and that's a challenge for both commercial and defense. So I think the key is that we have to hone in on those niches, testing and evaluation, for example, of technologies in the region. That's We should be doing that, not bringing people in to do it, because we know the region. Yeah, and you're so that. right. So right. We have to do that. This is a great opportunity for not only the people you are going to recruit and the companies that will recruit them, um, but for the state. And I, you know, I really appreciate you thinking big that way. Thank you very much, Bernice and Kylie. Uh, it's been a great discussion. Both you guys are great. And I hope we can do this again because I think this is a message that has to be repeated. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Aloha. Aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.